welcome to worship here at St. Paul. We're so glad that you joined us. Our first hymn comes from the Faith We Sing hymnal number 2223, They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love. Let's affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed found on page number 881. I believe, I believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and, and in Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you um, that you are a God who is with us, that your presence never leaves us. Lord, there are so many needs, there are so many burdens, concerns, so many who are sick and grieving. Lord, our world is in desperate need of a God who is there for us. And Lord, we ask that you would bring healing, that you would heal the brokenhearted, that you would bring peace and comfort, that you would bring hope in the midst of despair. Lord, we trust you and we turn to you with every need, even our daily bread. And Lord, we celebrate um, the blessings, the gifts that you give to us. We celebrate um, the opportunity to worship you, the mercies that are new each and every morning. And Lord, um, we thank you for your word. We thank you um, that you still speak to us, that you're a living and active God. We pray that you would speak to us uh, this morning, that our ears, um, our minds would be open to what you have to say to us, and that our hearts would be open to your transformation in our lives. And now, uh, let's pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our, our Father, Father, who Lord art in heaven... heaven Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we'll move into a time where you're invited to give your tithes and offerings uh, to God through St. Paul. Uh, you can give online at give.stpaulos.org or through the mail at P.O. Box 909, Ocean Springs, Mississippi, 39566. We thank you so much for your generosity and giving uh, to the mission of helping people meet, know, and serve Jesus Christ here at St. Paul. Now... Uh, we'll pray our offertory prayer. Patient, Patient and merciful God, God we, bring we bring our offerings, offerings humbly on this day, day hoping, hoping they will they bring will fruit, fruit to the ministry, the ministry of, of your church, church on earth. earth. We, we ourselves, ourselves have not always set our priorities on bearing good fruit, good fruit and, and yet you are a patient gardener. gardener. May our journey this Lenten season feed our spirits to bring forth the fruit you desire. We pray in the name of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus the Christ. Amen. that you may or may not know about me is that I love to travel. I love to see new things and have new experiences. I love that feeling right when you step in the doors of an airport and it's so exciting. But with travel, there also comes a lot of stress. Uh, so when Nathan and I are traveling, he's the one who's often a bit more anxious, a bit more stressed out when it comes to the trip details, and um, he is a lot more stressed out when we're in the airport. He's wanting to make sure we're getting to the right gate at the right time with all of our belongings, and he'll always ask me over and over again, do you have your wallet? Do you have your passport? And it can just get a little bit annoying at times, but I will admit that I can be fairly absent-minded 
at times. So I get, I get where he's coming from. But there was one time in particular, we were on our honeymoon. We had flown to Australia and we were getting on a connecting flight, uh, going one, from one part of Australia to another. Um, and we had made it through customs, but we had to go through security again. And I'm looking in my bag, getting out my passport, and I can't find it anywhere. The panic that I felt uh, was unlike any other. I don't know if y'all have ever been in that kind of situation, but I couldn't find my passport. And of course, Nathan had his. Like I said, he's very type A on trips. And even though we were newlyweds at that time, he was very upset at me. Uh, so we had to hurry up. We had to retrace our steps looking for this passport. But we finally found it. The, ladies at the, the lady at the customs check, she had accidentally kept it in her hand rather than giving it back to me. Um, so let me clarify, this situation was not my fault. Uh, it may or may not have been my fault that I didn't notice that I didn't have my passport with me, uh, but we were able to make it to our gate in time. We were able to make it safely to our final destination. There is a lot of stress that comes with traveling, but it's always worth it when you make it to your final destination. And life is a lot like this too. Life is a journey. There's a lot of twists and turns, ups and downs, a lot of highs and lows, so much stress along the way. But in the end, we all have a final destination. And the reality for every single one of us is that one day we will die. But the question is, when we die, where is our destination? And the Bible makes it clear that those who have faith in Jesus Christ will spend eternity in heaven in the presence of God. But for those who don't have faith, the destination is different. The destination is hell, eternal punishment apart from the presence of God. And as we're navigating the journey of life, it's so important because that is what determines our eternal destination. The way that we walk out our faith now matters for eternity. Well, back in Jesus' day, whenever they took a journey, there were no cars, no trains, no planes. And when they were trying to get somewhere, they had only one of two options. They could either walk there or they could ride an animal. And I'm not sure which of those would be better or worse, but most of the time, people in Jesus' day, they walked to get to their next destination. They didn't have the luxuries of traveling anywhere fast. So it makes sense that the Bible describes the Christian life as a walk. They were used to walking. They knew what this was like, the journey, the toil, the stress that it took on them. And there's several different places in the Bible that talk about this walk. They show us how we're called to walk. So today we're going to look at a few of those scriptures that describe how we are to walk out our faith. So first, let's read one verse from 1 John chapter 2. It's verse 6. It says this, Whoever claims to abide in him must walk as Jesus walked. How are we supposed to walk? We're supposed to walk as Jesus walked. It says, whoever claims to abide in Jesus, whoever claims to know Jesus, to follow Jesus, if we say that we're a Christian, we must walk as Jesus walked. We must live like Christ walk like he walked, to talk like he talked, to love like he loved. This verse makes it so clear. It's not just enough to talk the talk. We've got to walk the walk. We've got to live out our faith. But walking like Jesus, that's a really high standard. Is it actually possible for our lives to look like Christ? 
Christ? How are we supposed to live up to that standard, to walk like Jesus? How are we supposed to do that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And I've got um, a picture of a bumper sticker that I want us to think about for just a minute. It says this, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Now think about that for a second. Technically, it's true. Because Christians definitely aren't perfect. Christians are definitely forgiven. But I think this bumper sticker communicates a wrong message. There's something that's a little bit off about the word just here. Christians aren't perfect. Just forgiven. This simplifies the gospel message just a little bit. It seems to imply that the only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian would be forgiveness. And let me be clear, that is a huge difference, but it's not the only difference. Being forgiven is not the only thing that sets us as Christians apart. Because if we follow Christ, our lives should also look very different from the world around us. We're going to talk for a couple minutes about some of the really important Christian doctrines. Now, normally I don't use some big, fancy Christian terms, but we're going to go there today. We're going to talk about three terms that describe what happens when we come to faith in Christ. They are justification, regeneration, and sanctification. Now, our sixth graders, our confirmation students, have done a really good job with learning these terms. So just hang in there with me today. So first, justification is what the bumper sticker was talking about. We are forgiven. When we're justified, it means that we are made right with God. The penalty of sin that we all deserve, because we've all sinned, all fallen short, the penalty that we all deserve is death. But Jesus came and he paid the debt that we owed. Jesus came and gave his life on the cross. And it was because of his death on the cross that we can be justified, just as if we never sinned. To be justified means that we are forgiven, that our slate is wiped clean, our sins wash white as snow. And then as we are justified, we are also regenerated. Regeneration means that we are born again. We're made new. We're given a new identity. We're now a member of the family of God. And this leads us to sanctification. So these first two, justification, regeneration, those are both works that God does for us, forgiving us, making us new. But sanctification is a work that God does in us. Sanctification is a work God does in us as we are transformed to be like Christ. So let's take a moment to recap and to boil these down. Justification is our forgiveness. Regeneration is our new birth. And sanctification is our transformation. And today we're talking about walking out our faith. We're talking about walking like Jesus walked. So we're going to focus on this last one, on sanctification. And in certain traditions, sanctification can be less emphasized. It can be less understood, but it's so important. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it directly addresses sanctification. It says this, It is God's will that you should be sanctified. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Sanctification is God's will for us, that we would be holy, that we would live like Christ, that we would walk as Jesus walked. 
And often when we throw these terms around, sanctified, holy, our mind immediately goes to following the rules. But sanctification is about so much more than that. It's about developing a relationship with God. This relationship with God that is based on love, where we love God so much that we desire to honor him with every part of our lives. Because we love God so much, we want nothing more than to obey his commands, to honor him, to walk as Jesus walked. So instead of thinking of God as this strict disciplinarian saying, shape up, try harder, be better, be holy, come on. Think of God walking alongside you. Think of God helping you along the way. Think of God shaping you into who he's called you to be. The bumper sticker, it said, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And that is true, but we aren't just forgiven. We are forgiven and empowered to live like Christ. We are justified and sanctified. It's not just about being forgiven, just not just about being released from the consequences of our sin, but also God freeing us from the power of sin in our lives. Jesus saved us from both the penalty and the power of sin. And sanctification is all about this second part, Jesus breaking the power of sin in our lives. And I love how Romans 6, verses 6 and 7 communicates this. It says this, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. To be a slave means that we are required to follow the orders of our master. And without Christ, that is what we are. We are slaves to sin. We are controlled by sin. Things like lying, envy, lust, fill in the blank. We are controlled by it without Christ. And sin, it's not something to be taken lightly. Sin will completely destroy us. But without Christ, we have no hope. We're in bondage to sin and destruction. But it's Christ's victory on the cross that the chains of sin can now be broken. It's because of Christ's victory on the cross that we're no longer held captive to sin, but we are set free. And when we surrender our lives to Jesus, our old selves are crucified with him. We are made completely new. We're given a new nature. But that doesn't mean that our old nature just automatically goes away. Throughout our entire lives, our journey of faith, our flesh remains in conflict with the spirit. Because Just because we're no longer slaves to sin, it doesn't mean that we aren't tempted. We continue to live in this constant tug of war going on between the flesh and the spirit. And Galatians 5, 16 and 17 clarifies this really well. It says this, So I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. In order for us to walk as Jesus walked, we walk by the spirit. Jesus has given us this great gift, the gift of his spirit to live within us. This same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And there is nothing that we could do in our own strength, but it's through the power of the spirit that we are able 
to be holy. I want to combat the lie that you can never be free from your sin. We hear that lie that humans are just stuck in sin. That's who we are. But it's not true. If we walk by the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But it's important for us to balance two truths. Because first, we need humility to acknowledge our sinfulness, to acknowledge that we're broken and we're in need of God, while also holding on to the fact that God does not want us to stay there. And I think a group that holds this balance really, really well is our Christian recovery programs. These groups, they understand how important it is that you start with confession, that you start with admitting failure, admitting sin, admitting brokenness, admitting our need for God. But in these programs, the goal is not to stay there in that brokenness. The goal is to progress through the stages of recovery to seek freedom, freedom from addiction, freedom from sin. And the stories of lives radically changed are so inspiring. And we too need to hold this same tension in our lives between our brokenness and our freedom in Christ. Admitting that we're sinners in need of God, but knowing God doesn't want us to stay there. That God has so much more for us. That his will for us is that we are sanctified. This transformation, this sanctification, it's not just for one day down the road when we die and get to heaven. But the power of God to transform us is available now. He sent his spirit to be with us now. And we don't walk this journey alone. God walks with us every step of the way. He shows us the way we should go. He shows us how we are to walk. And I want us to read two verses from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. They say this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This passage says it so clearly, be imitators of God. Imitate God. Be like God. Watch what God does and do it. Be holy as God's holy. Walk as Jesus walked. And this verse shows us how we are to do this. It says, be imitators of God. As beloved children. Be imitators of God as beloved children. This is our identity in Christ. We are children who are dearly loved by God. And we too should imitate God just like a kid imitates their parents. Our daughter, Laurel, she watches us do things and she picks up on them really quickly. Uh, When Laurel sees me bringing my laundry basket to the laundry room, she'll just go in her room and grab her little laundry basket and follow me in there. Or if I'm doing a workout at home, I'm doing some squats, she'll try to squat, she'll try her best, she'll ultimately fall over. It doesn't work very well, but she doesn't stop her from trying to imitate me. Another thing that she sees us doing is using our phones, and she wants to do that as well. She's already figured out how to take pictures and videos and find all her favorite emojis, and not too long before she's going to start calling people herself. Um, But it's kind of scary how much Laurel imitates us. It makes you realize the huge responsibility that you have to be a good example for your kids. But this relationship of a parent and a child is the same that we have with God. Just as a kid imitates their parents, we too should imitate our Father in heaven. The more time we spend with God, the more we know God, the more we imitate God. 
Just like a parent loves and disciplines and redirects their kids, God, our Father, does this throughout our journey of sanctification. And in Ephesians 5, when it's talking about imitating God, it specifically says we are to walk in love. And I want to read a quote from a pastor in Pittsburgh. His name is Steve Cordell. I love his quote. It really helps you to put things in perspective. He says this, There is no way to become like Jesus without growing in love. Love is not an add-on. Love is the point. It's so important for us not just to receive Christ's love in our lives, not to just receive forgiveness and a new identity, and to then stop there. I hope that we are then inspired to go out and love others with the same love that we've received. We cannot imitate God and not love. Love is not an add-on. Love is the point. So if we say that we follow Christ, if we say that we are Christians, we must walk as Jesus walked. We must walk by the Spirit We must walk in love. Walking in love isn't always easy because we're not just called to love those who love us back. We're called to love like Jesus loved. He loved all people. He loved even his enemies. Loving like Jesus, it looks like sacrifice. It looks like laying down our lives for others. Walking in love in a world that's full of hatred and division and war and pain, it's not an easy road to walk. Today we've been talking about going on a journey. And if you're a parent, you know what it's like on a long road trip. It's so difficult to keep your kids occupied, especially when they're annoyed at being in the car seat for so long. And you hear over and over again that dreaded question, Are we there yet? Well, I think that we can relate to this question when it comes to our spiritual lives, our spiritual journey. We ask God, are we there yet? Because the journey of life, it comes with a lot of stress, a lot of struggle. Jesus never said following him would be easy. As we walk out our faith, we can grow weary. But we are not there yet. We have not yet finished our race. This sanctification, it happens both in a moment and it's a journey that lasts a lifetime. It's a lifetime of being transformed into the image of God. It's a lifetime of walking out our faith. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And it can be a difficult journey. It can be difficult to walk like Jesus. It can be difficult to walk by the Spirit. It can be difficult to walk in love. But the final destination, eternal life with God in heaven, is more than worth it. We're not there yet. But today I encourage you to keep pressing on. Keep pressing on with eternity in mind. Keep growing in your relationship with God. Keep walking in love even when it's difficult to do. Keep taking steps in the right direction. Today, I invite you to take a step toward God. Take a step toward holiness. Take a step toward whatever it is that God is calling you to do. And as you continue to walk out your journey of faith, remember the calling God has for you. He's called you to walk as Jesus walked, to walk by the Spirit, and to walk in love. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for your love that you so generously poured out to us. Thank you for coming to this earth and dying for us, for paying the debt that we owed, for forgiving us, and not just forgiving us, but setting us free from the power of sin. Lord, we want to live into that power. 
Lord, thank you for sending us your Holy Spirit to live within us. And Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit afresh and anew today. That we would not gratify the desires of our flesh, but we would walk by your Spirit. And Lord, in this world that is so full of pain and hatred and division, Lord, we are called to walk in love. Would you empower us to love others with the love that we have received? Help us to love like you loved. Help us to walk like you walk. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we'll sing together our final hymn, number 430, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. <laughs> so much for joining us in worship today. As you go throughout your week, go walking as Jesus walked, walking by the Spirit and walking in love. Go in peace. Amen.